people, you're the second youngest in the family of eight, <coughs> and you went off to university. Was that an unusual thing in itself for your family? Uh, it, yeah, my sister went to teacher's training college, but I was, I was the first in the family to go to university. But it wasn't, it wasn't that unusual. In, I mean, I was a big comprehensive, and there was 2,000 pupils in the, this comprehensive. And I'd say in my year, out of about 30 in the class, there would be about 12 of us went to university. So which, which these days actually would be an incredible statistic because education, sadly, in my country has gone back the way really badly, really badly. The, the, the cutbacks and the, the attitude to education and the fact that in England, they are not paid fees. In Scotland, the education is becoming more and more expensive. Um, but there's no way I can afford to go to university now. No way, because we, we had no money. And my father died the day we started, the day I started university. Um, so we didn't have any money, a, a grant system is the only way that I could get through. But educationally, I, I think for a school of 2,000 pupils, the vast majority of us were on free, free school meals, so it was a relatively poorer working class school. There were upper working class and some lower middle class, but most of us would be in the economically for what I am not deprived to see this award, but the definitely poor bracket. Yeah. So 12 each year was, was not bad. The downside was in the same year we had two, two killings. You know, there's killings quite regularly at my school, which was very, you got so used to it. But looking back, it's quite, quite bad. In fact, extremely bad. Very bad. It's not really being killed at school, it's not really. <laughs> Did you uh, discover drama there? Uh, yeah, it was uh, Did you work really hard at university, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah like no, over I, just, no, I discovered drama at school. Um, I, I, I'd been a bad boy um, for a couple of years and it, it, it left school, a dog school as we call it. And they eventually caught me and, and sent me back. But that time I'd left the gangs. And just as a way of, I don't know what it was, but just as a way to get away from that, that circle, I thought, what can I do that will make them not ever want me back in with it? The tough guys. So uh, there was an audition for school pantomime. <laughs> I thought, fucking be an actor. Everybody hates an actor, you know. Uh, they'll leave me alone. Um, not in a violent way. They wanted to bring me back into that sort of stupid adolescent way of life. So I signed up to play at signed up. I auditioned to play Buttons in Cinderella. And they gave me a script, it was just it had been written for the six years, the prefects, the posh kids. And it was, it was fucking terrible, but the headmaster was watching. And he said, oh, stop, stop, stop. And he gave a terrible limp. And he, he, he limped down Richard the Third Lake. And he, he wrote something, a piece of paper, and, and gave it to me. And I did love all this shit. And it just sounded just very dramatic. And he had a line, and the line was, the last time I saw, the last time I saw a lolly was in Telly Savalas' mouth. That was the line. <laughs> and I swear, I read this out, this guy at the back shouted the headmaster, that's my buttons. Give <laughs> <laughs> was that, that's my buttons. I loved it. I just felt this light come on me like this. <laughs> this is my destiny. <laughs> oh, yeah. sweet mystery of life at last I found you. <laughs> Such a buzz out of that. Yeah. So yeah. you carried that on through university. And what were you studying at university? Uh, economic history and drama. Right. Yeah. So you were part of drama clubs and stuff? No, as part of drama, the drama course at Glasgow University was uh, primarily academic. It, you, you, you found your own means to make it, um, to apply it, for it to be, to practice it. So you, you did your own shows and all that kind of stuff. I didn't do much. I was. Throughout the university, I was writing and directing little eight millimeter short films. I wasn't, I wasn't interested in acting at all. You know, I mean, I never cast myself in them or anything like that. I'm so a fairly academic side. So, was there a point um, after university that you applied for any kind of film school? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I applied for the National Film School when I was 21, and I submitted an eight millimeter film, um, and I had no money, and we shot it obviously with no money. And I, I sent it off to the film school, and and it had all the 
splicing tape still on it. I couldn't afford to run off a, a copy and I couldn't afford a soundtrack. So I put in a, a little a cassette and I wrote in the script, press button now. <laughs> <laughs> and I did all this and I put it in this little, because I had no money, I had no money. And I sent it off to them and they sent it back. And I, it actually took me a couple of years to find out they'd never actually watched it. And that actually really upset me because I genuinely believed and obviously still believe that, that film should be obviously a meritocracy. It shouldn't be based on how much money you've got or where you come from. And sadly, it, it, the same year that I applied with my little eight millimeter film, which maybe wasn't good enough to get me in anyway, I don't know. Um, the same year that I made that application, maybe some students that from the university, uh, Robert Bolt, a very famous English playwright who wrote A Man For All Seasons, um, his son Jeremy had an application film, I found this out a few years later, <coughs> and in his application film, to get into the National Film School as a young man, he made it on 60mm with an Oscar winning cinematographer and John Hurt in the leading role. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, the, cla the class system's alive and well, because this was maybe the film school that really promoted itself as saying, whoever you are, if you've got talent, you know, and I'm not saying I've forgotten and I'm not better about it, I swear, I've got a big chip, but when you see the difference, I mean, an application film with John Hurt is going to carry a little bit more, but <laughs> like set, well, an engineering student who played the lead in my fucking film, you know I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't you find out a few years later that they've even looked at the film? Yeah, no, they never watched it. They never watched well, it. Did you go back and speak there or something? No, they asked me to teach there for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll only teach her if you, I know you looked at my film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I actually, I got past the stage of even, you know, revenge is sweet. You know, <laughs> it was, no, I mean, who cares? But it does bother me for young filmmakers now that, sadly, in our profession, there's, I'm, rabidly anti-nepotistic, uh, uh, particularly in our racket. And sadly to this day, that's still the way it works. And we have to break it, we have to find the means of structures to break that, because even to this day, you could run us on sets, very nice people. When you chat to these youngsters, you know, you know, you're chatting, how did you get this gig? Honestly, nine out of 10 times now, it's, well, my uncle's the gaffer. My, my father's a pal of the DOP. No. And it's all that, you know, and I understand that, I'm not going to get, I know that goes on, mm -hmm. but I, I really would love a time when someone says, well, you know, I went and I studied this, but I didn't study anything, I just want to do it, you know, a complete open, uh, you know, policy. And I think it's a real ongoing issue within film especially, that the old school tie or family connections and all that sort of stuff, it, it's, it's something we really have to find the means to, to break through, because otherwise it's just one, it just becomes an elitist kind of, incestuous kind of circle, you know, and also within a racket, as I'm sure you guys know, you know, it, what gets you work is when you get your first little gig, you know, if you get, if you start off as a runner, you meet a second assistant who's doing another film, he takes you onto the other film, you kind of move up the ladder a little bit, and, you know, that's how it kind of works. Mm. So getting in is the difficult part. It's the really hard part. Obviously you weren't um, daunted by being turned down by yeah. film school and you kept making films. Well, actually that's not true. Actually, no, I was, actually. I didn't make an art film until I was 33. And no, I was devastated, if I'm being honest. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So the I moved in the acting. Right. And, and, and you writing, a few acting roles. No, I wrote for, for theatre. We used to write cabarets and then I wrote uh, sitcoms. For, television and stuff, or trying to. Uh, we ended up being commissioned for one, but I sabotaged it. So then Close, which was your first short film, how it was did you... It was actually the third, but it was the first, first, kid, one that, okay. first grown up one. First grown up one, okay. Yeah. And did you just keep working with friends to make those short films? Did you did you have a community of filmmakers around yeah, you? Yeah, well that was yeah. a thing. I, I, by that time I'd done a lot of theatre, my confidence was growing, 
Um, I've had a terrible experience, not well, a terrible experience, excuse me. Um, I spoke about it yesterday. There was a gentleman on a tag up who had asked me to be less good as, a, as, a, as an actor. He said, Could you be less good? And that really hit me, really, really affected me. And I asked my thought, oh, fuck this, I'm going to make my own. And in between the times, there was a big competition, a writing competition for short films. And, and I sent one in, and they got something like 7,000 applications. And, and I was chosen along with uh, another chap. And if you won the competition, they made your short film. And, and I was just over the moon. I had just turned 30. Manny was just born, my eldest. You know what you do? You think, shit, I'm, I'm, I'm getting somewhere. I mean, I've never been career orientated, if I'm being absolutely honest. But just trying to make your, get your work done. And uh, so they invited me along, and it was a director, a proper grown up director who was kind of eccentric, and, and I thought, oh, yeah, you know, but I wasn't consulted about anything. Anyway, cut long story short, they, 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 they shot it, and they sent me a tape, and I, it was the first time my daughter had ever seen me cry, because this tape, this thing, was a complete aberration of what I'd written. Oh. I mean, it was so, it was so awful. So literally, but, you, but, saw, you handed over the script? Yeah, that, I, didn't know, that was I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know any better. And also, I'm sorry, they're offering me 3,000 quid. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm earning 250 pounds a week in theatre, if, if I'm lucky enough to be working at all. <laughs> so not three grand, honestly, a ton of money to me. And we were living in this little slum. Nice slum, it was a slum. Um, <laughs> but they, what I couldn't believe was they used every single line of my dialogue. And it was just not my dialogue. That's not what I wrote. But their intent was so the opposite of everything. It was so ladled with class prejudice. I mean, it, they, I'm not bore you with the short film I've ever made, but the very simple story was it's a little boy studying for, for, for university. He has to go onto the roof to fix the aerial. And as he's fixing the aerial, there's a, an eclipse of the moon and it transpires his thoughts are sent out to the world. Mm. That's it. It's a little 10 minute light comedy about what happens when you're 14 and when nobody listens, when you're 15, mm. and nobody listens to you and you find out the whole fucking world's listening to you, mm. right? And I thought, that's a nice little conceit, 10 minutes. It's, it's a nice little piece, a gentle piece. Jesus, the, the portrayal of the parents was something, I swear, that's why I wept. They had these because they were working class. So I had written two working class parents. Or two working class parents, fairly nice, smart, natural, flawed, open human beings. They had these two fucking cretins. Such <laughs> that. Honest to God, honest to God, you know that way I sat there going, no fucking way. <laughs> Do this. And honestly, I was so shocked because this was like 1991, 92, and you're thinking, have we not moved on from when you was morons think that if you're working class, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's your sign that you shouldn't control your own work. Well, right. you couldn't get a more sure sign if you yeah. control your own <laughs> Jesus. Honestly, God, that, that, that after the be less good. And that, you're thinking, oh no, screw this. I mean, yes, I, I, you know, King Silver and all that, King Shilling. I got the three grand, but it wasn't worth that kind of grief. No. So for 500 quid, I made a little short film in the little slum that we lived in, and it did well, won awards and all that shit. Yeah. And in the five days shooting it, I had the best five creative days of my life. I just, and there was no money, we didn't have any money. Didn't give them, honestly, I couldn't have cared less. I'm not really money oriented anyway, but it was just the, the joy of, of creation, of, of something that you could go, yeah, this is mine. You might not like it, but it's mine. Yeah. Yep. And is that when the idea for orphans started, started coming to you? No. That's your first feature, right? No, I did two other, two other shorts after that. And the next one we made for £2,000. And the next one, the BBC gave us 42,000 pounds. 
Yeah, but it's interesting though, in terms of the process for those of us who make these kind of films, what was interesting was I have already budgeted that we could have shot that for two grand, but we couldn't pay anybody again, and I'd already got two films where none of us could pay. So the BBC said, well, we'll give you 42,000. And I said, but only if we keep, I get complete control. And, and they were really nervous about it, because apparently, apparently it broke the record of the BBC in this short film. It's 70 minutes long, and there are 72 cunts. <laughs> so the word cunt is said 72 times in 70 minutes, which is unusual for the BBC. <laughs> I did another film later on, and and there was a line I had, and the line for this other character was, "Did you get a wank?" And the director came over and said, "Jesus, you've used up all our swear count. The BBC's got a swear count, and the swear count is I swear this is God's truth. Swear count is uh, eight bastards, four uh, eight bastards, six fucks, and no cunts." <laughs> I am going to stick by my word. <laughs> I'm offering you 
miss our Golden Globe winning squillions of dollars, I'm offering you ten and a half thousand pounds <laughs> for my score, because that's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> He had to knock, he knocked back the fifth element. I mean, good man, well, I like the fifth element, but he lost a ton of money, but he knocked that back to do, to do, you know, my wee film was just like way, way down the food chain. Our budget was a million and a half or something. And while you were shooting orphans, you were being wooed by Mr. Ken Loach, who um, you worked with before. And yeah, he wanted right, you to be right. in My Name is Joe. Mm. But, um, but he wouldn't really tell you much about it, and you had a, quite a dilemma, didn't you? Mm. Deciding which, what to do and how to yeah. make it work, because of course, Orphans is your life. Sure, sure. It's nine months of your life, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so much is it's your first feature, and all yeah. life, what that feels like. Right. Yeah. So how did that transpire? Um, we were working on um, shooting Orphans, and Ken approached me to do a film called Mangy the Joke. And we met, and I worked with Ken um, for three days um, on Riff Raff. In 19, 1990, I think. And then I got to the wire for another Kenny Woods film called Raining Stones. And I didn't get the job. But he, he gave me the nicest knockback I've ever had in my life. He left a message with my, my ex wife saying, Really, could, could you write this down? And she wrote it down because I'm a massive Kenny Woods fan. And she said, that, Sorry, Peter, I didn't get the job, but I think he's a great actor and we will work together one day. I swear, that was a week before I realised I hadn't got the job. I was so chuffed. I was just like, whoa, whoa. You still got it? said, great actor, me, great actor. I was, I was in my element, in my element. So he comes along when we're doing Joe, and he, we, he, Ken doesn't give you a script or even what it's about. And he just says, it's a film called My Name is Joe. We'd like you to be in it. We'd like you to play Joe. And, and he's a recovering alcoholic. And, and I said, cool. And I thought she'd ask, a, a, you know, a reasonably intelligent question. And because Ken said any questions. Because that's it, that's all he's told me about. And, and, I, and, I, and I said, well, what, 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 what was it made him give up alcohol? What made him turn his back on demon drink? And Ken smiled benignly, as he always does. And he said, I just, I just, I just not talk about that. <laughs> that that's all I knew about my name is Joe, let's not talk about it. That's all I knew. <laughs> So we do orphans and then it transpires that the fact in order to do my name is Joe, they, they couldn't get the gates to work. They couldn't get it to work. So finally David Orkin, who was the most powerful man in British cinema at the time on the back of Train Squad, David Orkin phones me up because we are cutting orphans. And at this time it's really doing my head and I'm trying to cut the film and, and, and I don't know if, if I'm to do Joe after the cut film at Orkin. It was all becoming a real mess. So, Orphans was everything to me, it was my baby, and I'd never even seen the script, my name is Joe, and but I desperately want to work with Ken, but all well, these things happen, I need to get my film cut. And Orkin phoned me from Nova Scotia, I was cut in Glasgow, and he said, um, I really don't want you to do my name is Joe. And I said, cool, you, you own my ass. So, right, he said, I think, um, I think you're perfect for the part, um, but I, I don't think you'll be taken seriously as an international filmmaker, if you do My Name is Joe, as an actor. Right? Like, whatever you say, I don't give a fuck, honestly. It's just, I just want to make my film, just make my, make my baby. About eight minutes later, Ken Loach is on the phone, and you're like, okay, and there's this little office, and Ken says, great news about My Name is Joe. I'm like, yeah, uh, I didn't know how to tell him. And he's, I said, what, what, what do you mean? He said, well, it's going to go ahead, we've worked out the dates. You finish filming, and we're going, to, we're going to keep on board your editor and your assistant editor, and we'll move all that to after we film My Name is Joe for post production. In other words, you've got the, the, cut, the, the, the cut of orphans, I would shoot My Name is Joe, and then we would do post production, and it would take us right to Christmas. And I said, I, I, When did you talk to David? He said, Oh, I'm just off the phone. I said, No, Ken, I, I still couldn't bring myself to tell him. I said, I'm just, I'm just off the phone to David. And he said, no, no, I'm literally off the phone. <laughs> and I went, what do you mean? He said, no, I've just put the phone down and I picked it up and spoke to you. <laughs> so there was a nine minute gap between Walker telling me, you're not doing it. I said, right, right, I'll take the hit. 
and Ken Loach telling me, you're doing it. <laughs> and I said, right, okay. And you're literally just off the phone. And you're like, yeah. I'm like, okay. I said, what did you stroke? Oh, Ken has got a complete turnaround. The most powerful man in British cinema at that time, and I swear he was powerful, and he knew it. A complete turnaround. And I'm like, what, what did you say to talk? And Ken said, we had a very constructive conversation. <laughs> I don't know, I, I don't, I, because Ken's one of those guys, you know, he looks very bookish and kind of like your favourite Latin teacher, and he's very, you know, very, very uh, gentle and, and, and kind, but he's got a fucking spine of solid plutonium. I mean, it's, it's really amazing to watch someone so, he looks so fragile and kind of, but when he wants something and goes for it, he will not back off. It, he's fascinating to watch for all you know, um, uh, 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 actors, directors, producers, it, when we all can then turn on me, so as we were shooting My Name is Joe, he starts kicking my head in over orphans. Suddenly didn't like the car, suddenly wants to change this. I was getting a kick in. Uh, like, he couldn't kick Ken, but he could kick me. And I remember saying to Ken one day, who didn't like to talk about anything out with of his film, quite rightly, I said, look, give me a hand here, what do I do? He's really kicking me. Uh, and Ken again said, I find saying no is very useful. <laughs> <laughs> and that really gentle, kind of, you know, English kind of way. Mm. And sort of nodded. Mm. You're thinking, fuck it, I thought of that one, just say no. <laughs> I think we've got a clip of My Name is Joe. If we could uh, play that down. <coughs> <coughs> Who, who locked you up for being too pretty? Who would, sorry, Dan. 
in that show. Um, do we have another short clip of Nathan? Peter, uh, ladies and gentlemen, could you please give a warm